All right. Simu simulate the mucus elevator. Get it working again. She's going to need some help there. Becca's laughing so hard, her glasses fell off. Wow. Well, this is interesting. I knew it. There's something wrong with those people. <laughs> if the charismatics were here, they would be like, that's right. They would be like, the anointing's all over this room. That's it. What's that? Yeah. One former member of uh, that used to be here said that when he was in Texas, <laughs> he said that they had a meeting, and he said that the Shekinah glory <laughs> fell down on him. We had to talk about that later. but <laughs> No, I didn't have a talk with him, but he said... <laughs> And they started doing like, they started, what was that called? What did he say they were doing? <laughs> yeah, a conga line all the way through the assembly. That's what they were doing. I was like, man, you sound like a bunch of Pentecostals. I mean, the first time I, and I'll get started, I promise. But the first time I went to, the first time I went to Texas, I was just, I sat in that chair on the front row and I was like this. And they start, they struck the band up and this 350 pound drummer went. And he just started going, and I was like, I didn't know what to do. I was in the front row, and I'm like, and my inner twang wanted to come out. You know, like, I wanted to make fun of him. I really didn't like it. I just, I, I didn't like it. I just, I, I wanted to go all hillbilly. But they just started going, and they just, I mean, they, they were, they were like, to me, they were rocking out. I think I recorded it and brought it back for you to listen to on my cell phone, and I had you listen to it. I was like, you're not going to believe this. I think I, sh I showed you, and I was like, this is crazy. And they're just like, I mean, they're, they were just like, like the mom was, the grandma was in the band too, and she's up there, and I'm like, what was she doing? Oh, this drummer was bigger than you've ever, I mean, you could ever imagine. He was huge. He was a big. <laughs> the, the pastor was playing the guitar, and, like, the big drummer dude was up there. And then, I mean, he's pounding, and I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm old school fundamentalist, so I'm going, I'm like, what in the world did I get myself into? I ain't hanging out with Finney anymore, man. I'm out of here. <laughs> the weirdest thing ever because that's where it was was that true and i was like okay this is weird man oh yeah yeah i won't say who it is and then he then i went to another church and i ended up getting an argument with the pastor well we technically it wasn't an argument we had a discussion for like three hours about repentance in his house in front of his wife and children which i did not want to do well, that was a weird trip Huh? No, no, no. No, that was Texas, yeah. Oklahoma was weird, too, but that's a different story. <coughs> it is. Well, I was still happy to get back north, though. I'm just not that kind of guy. I just don't boogie like that. I don't do that <laughs> stuff, man. I don't add boogie into my worship music. <laughs> I just, I just, I don't do that, man. That's not me. I was like, okay, I gotta get out of here. I want to bring David Cloud in here and burn the house down. <laughs> 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 just go get shit, right? Or Alan Ives. Okay, you're all pagan. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to do. We're we're gonna talk about music again, though. We have to sometime. <clears throat> Except I'll do some PowerPoints and some other things and play some clips. Brother Andrew and I might do some things together, too. We're going to do so a few things like that in the future. So, But um, anyway, Isaiah chapter 6. And we won't stay here. We'll be all over the Bible here. We're going to maybe finish up tonight with, with angels, with dealing with angels, and then get back into Acts chapter 8 um, and kind of finish. Well, I don't know if we'll finish, but we'll get back into it anyway and talk talk about Philip and the eunuch and what took place there. 
and just kind of the mindset of all that that happened at the time and the interesting factors that, that went into that. Now, we may be finished here tonight with this. Um, there are a few other things that I'd like to, but we'll see if I have time to do that. Anyway, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So as we can see here, Isaiah is, is standing. He is standing there. He's taken up in a vision. In the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That's the train. That's the, so there, there are seraphims everywhere. We're going to see in verse number two. There is the glory of God everywhere around the throne, right? He is right there. Uh, and above it stood the seraphims, each one. But notice this is in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, I'm not trying to do expositional preaching on this verse, but I have to tell you something, that King Uzziah was a very loved king. And he was a king, I believe, for 50 years. I want to say 40 or 50 years. I think he was the longest king ever that Israel had. And he was a very successful king. But here, why do you think God brought Isaiah to the throne? I'll tell you why. Because he was discouraged because King Uzziah had died. Right? He was discouraged. So God was showing him a throne that was higher than a throne on earth. He was showing him a bigger throne. He was showing him his throne. He was showing him that God rules in the heavens. No matter what goes on earth, God still rules in the heavens. God is still over all. God is still king of kings and lord of lords. No matter who's king in Israel, no matter who's president of the United States, no matter who's anywhere else in this world ruling it, God overrules all. He overrules all. His, he is high and lifted up. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. Interesting, isn't it? That you have a six-winged uh, being here. Uh, some would say beast even at that sense. Um, but it's an order. It's an order of angels. There are many different orders. Well, there are a few different orders of angels, at least three that we know of. But we know that there, there are the cherubims and there are the seraphim here. They are two different orders of angels. They are not the same. They are very similar. And there's some interesting things about Revelation that I'm going to cross over and show you their similarities. And I don't believe that we can explain it all. I don't believe that's possible uh, to do that. I had some things in here that, you know what, I think I might have put that away. I'll probably conk myself in the head here, but let me see. Is there? All right. Go see if on that table there, there's, oh, it might be here. Let's see here. I forgot about that that I was going to read. Yep, that's it. Okay, good. So I've, I have it right here. I want to read you out of Strong's McClintock tonight, some information about seraphim, some more information. So it goes a little bit deeper to explain them a little bit. And then we're going to get into some, some of the, the translation of the word seraphim, what that means exactly, and kind of understand that. Let's pray. Father, Lord, please be with us now. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, in the year that King Uzziah died. So he says, above it stood the seraphims, each one. He, he, he describes them. And then one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So these seraphim are there to cry out to God. They are there to sing praises unto God. They are there. You know what? You're here to sing praises unto God, too. That's why you're here. Let's go back and talk about that for a second. Uh, God's throne high and lifted up and that he ruleth over all. Do You know, whatever you're going through tonight, God is ruling over it all. Whatever trial you're facing tonight, whatever doubts and fears and, and whatever health problems you have, whatever um, anxieties you have, whatever sources of discomfort that you have, whatever trials that you're facing tonight, decisions that you must make, it is God's throne that is high and above all of them. He rules over all of it. You ought to remember that. You and I have to remember that. God knows where you're at. He knows where you're at. He knows the situation that you're in. He knows what you're going through. And he is well able to see you through all of it. God knows. And you need to trust him. You need to believe that promise of God. Amen. 
We've got to believe that. We see them say, holy, holy, holy. Why do you think there's three? Yeah, one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. That's why there's three. You always see that same in threes like that when it comes to God. They cried one to another all day. That's what they cry. Focusing on the holiness of God. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. We always see that, don't we? When we see the presence, when we talked about the cherubims, when we talked about God's presence, his throne on, on, on Mount Zion. Remember that? Uh, when, his, when his throne comes down on the mountains of Zion, when he comes down on Mount Sinai, there was what? There was fire. There was smoke. There was a cloud. All those, there were jewels. All those things were present. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, man, am I holy. Man, am I sinless. Feels good to be sinlessly perfect. That's not what he said, is it? They didn't walk around, and Isaiah wasn't walking around and saying, man, I'm, I mean, I've arrived. <laughs> I am at the throne of God. Right? Well, you've got all these preachers today, though, that these the holiness movement and these Pentecostals and these others that are preaching a sinless perfection. A Christian perfection, they call it. And they're they're saying that, well, you know, if you really get saved, I mean. I mean, really get saved. Well, then you'll, you'll have Christian perfection and you you won't sin. You'll be sinless. You'll walk around in Christian perfection. Now, I, I, will, I will tell you this, that in the scriptures, there is a pattern. And the closer a man gets to God, the more sin he sees in himself. <laughs> That's just the truth. Some of you may shudder sometimes because your sin is ever before you and present in you, and it may not have bothered you at times before as bad as it does now. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're further away from God. Many times that could be that you're closer to God. And the closer you are, the light shines and the holes are revealed. That doesn't mean that you're farther away from God. It means that you're getting closer to him. And you're starting to see things that bother you that didn't bother you before. And then you're like, well, why didn't it bother me before? Because you're growing in grace. You're growing. You're getting closer to the Lord. And now you're seeing things before that you didn't see. And it isn't very fun. But it isn't supposed to be. It's supposed to be sobering. It's supposed to warn us. It's supposed to show us, well, this is us. This is something we have to work on. That doesn't mean that. Just because you're going through something right now that, that God is far from you. Usually it's just the opposite. You know, usually, usually it's just the opposite is that God is very near you. And he is trying you. He is showing you who you really are. You know, I, I'm ha I have a hard time with those guys. Now listen, I've been saved for 18 years almost. And... When I see guys walk or uh, run around the Internet and all these places and they're talking about how how they don't sin. <laughs> I, first, I laugh. OK, then 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 the, then the next thing I think is. That's really strange because a person that is walking in sobriety. They understand their depravity. And they know full well it is not gone from them. Proof of that is right here. He didn't say, man, look at me. Did he? He didn't say that, did he? Then said I, woe is me. That's what he said. He didn't say, man, look at me. I am pretty good. I'm telling you what, I'm pretty holy. No. He said, woe is me, for I am undone. But by the way, he didn't pick on his country first. 
He didn't say, man, them churches are wicked. Right? He didn't say that, did he? Man, America's wicked. Those lost people are wicked. Well, they are, but that's not what he said. What did he say? He said, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. He said, it's me. And I dwell in the midst of a, pe of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Think about that. He caught a glimpse of God's throne. He saw it. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. I think that's interesting. Remember we talked about that, those coals of fire? Remember we talked about the, uh, with the cherubim? Remember when they had that? And he said, go take a coal off that fire. Remember when he said that to him? He said that to the man in, that was clothed in what? Linen. He said, go, go take that coal off the fire. Go take one of those coals off there. Look at this. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. So what does he say to him? And he laid it upon the, my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Amen. What's that? It's the ministry of Jesus. That's what Jesus did. Us. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, who will go for us? That's right, Lee. That's right. And also the voice of the Lord say, whom shall I send and who will go for us? There's another Trinity verse. Right? Who's us? The holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Amen. So angels, uh, the, these the definition that is it, that we find in uh, Webster's, I think it is, says that they're the angels of the highest order in the celestial hierarchy. Their angelic being is connected with God's throne and holiness. So every time that you see them, they are connected to the throne. Kind of like a king always has a procession. He always has guards. He always has singers. David. It, it, see, people don't realize all the things that David did. All he was doing was modeling after what was in heaven. I mean, he had singers, he had choirs, he had all those other, all, all of those things were modeled after the throne. That's why he had people that's, that did nothing but praise God all day long. Why? Because that's heaven. That's heaven. Is praising God all day long. Boy, we really don't do a good job of that, do we? I know this is supposed to be about angels, right? But isn't it true that we really tend to fret and fuss about ourselves and what we're going through or what our challenges are, and we really don't praise God enough? We, we don't spend our time praising God. Something to think about, isn't it? Good example. All right, let's see. Let's read you a very deep and boring dictionary. That'll be good. That'll make you want to come back next week. All right, let's see here. Let me find it. Here they are. Oh, they have a weird weird picture of a guy named Serapis at a Egyptian mythology. Okay, well, let's read you a little bit about this here, though, of, of some things that they said. Seraphim, the plural of the word, celestial beings described in Isaiah chapter 6, like we talked about, an order of angels or ministers of God who stand around his throne, having each six wings and also hands and feet, and praising God with their voices. They were therefore a human form, and like the cherubim, furnished with wings as the swift messengers of God. Some have indeed identified the cherubim and seraphim as the same beings, but under names descriptive of different qualities. 
So they, they say they're different qualities with them. Seraphim denoting the burning and dazzling appearance of the beings elsewhere described as cherubim. So that word, which we're going to get to, we're going to describe some of that word, but it means to burn. Seraphim, that's what it means. It means to burn. That's what that word means, the first part of that. It would be difficult either to prove or disprove this, he says, but there are differences between the cherubim of Ezekiel and the seraphim of Isaiah, which it does not appear easy to reconcile. The living creatures of the former prophet had four wings, the seraphim of the latter six, and while the cherubim had four faces, the seraphim had but one. If the figures were in all cases purely symbolic, the difference does not signify. So he's going on to say they, they take from all different sources. What is Strong's McClintock is it's a, it's a dictionary of, well, it's an encyclopedia, actually, of biblical facts and studies. So let's say you wanted to study something to do. It's not, not just biblical, but Christian. So let's say you wanted to study Mount Sinai, for instance, or something like that. So then you would go to this, and if you couldn't find what you wanted to on here, which a lot of times you can't, because there's some things, not about Sinai, but other things, you can't find anything on. But Strong's McClintock will have it in there. It, it'll, he'll have, they'll have, like, a lot on it. They'll have a lot on it. So anyway, so they're, they're very useful for that, for that instance. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they'll find you some things that... Uh, that, that may not be out there. Some historical facts that are kind of not, not around. Uh, let's see here. He says, um, let's see. There is much symbolic force and propriety in the attitude in which the seraphim are described as standing while two of their wings were kept ready for instant flight in the service of God. With two others, they hid their faces to express their unworthiness to look upon the divine majesty. Um, so he explains that a little bit there. Let's see if he says anything that's... We may observe the idea. Of, okay, so a lot of he's going to talk about that. A lot of the cultures that are out there, they have these demigods, right? They have that that have wings, and they have they fly, and they have hands, and they're similar to those seraphims. Well, where'd they get it from? They got it from a perversion of the Bible. They got it from a perversion of the truth. That's where they got it from. And some of them are close to the same because they probably worshipped some form of an angel or some form of being or a hybrid being, some form of beast, right? We don't know how many fell or who fell with all those and how many were in an order. We don't know exactly all those things. We don't know. God never told us. He says, we observe that the idea of a, of a winged human figure was not peculiar to the Hebrews. Among the sculptures found at Morogob in Persia, we meet with the representation of a man with two pairs of wings springing from the shoulders and extending the one pair upwards, the other downwards, so as to admit a covering the head of the feet. The wing in the instance imply deification for speed and ease of motion to stand in man's imagination among the most prominent tokens of divinity. So the fact that they had the wings... Uh, let's see here. He says, talks about the head and the feet. The meaning of the word seraph is extremely doubtful. The only word which resembles it in the current uh, Hebrew is seraph, which the idea of brilliancy has been extracted. Such a brilliance would harmonize with other depictions of celestial beings. So there's talk about a light, brilliance, burning, which we're going we're gonna to kind of get to here. So the uniformly translated word for that is to burn. It's translated in different areas. The same word as seraph is translated in the King James Bible differently in Numbers chapter 21. So turn there, Numbers chapter 21. To burn, okay? It's the same thing, a fiery serpent, right? Uh, let's go to Numbers 21 here. Twenty one and verse eight. And the Lord said to Moses, make thee a fiery serpent. So you see that it is interesting, isn't it? A fiery serpent and set upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. There's a, so that means to burn. It means fiery. It's a fiery serpent. Then uh, go to Isaiah chapter 14. This will be interesting. Isaiah 14, 29. 
Rejoice not thou, whole Palestinia, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. And his fruit shall be a fiery, flying serpent. Starting to get the picture? A fiery, flying serpent. It's the same word as that seraph. It's the sa- that's the same word. Okay, so we know what the f- who the flying fiery serpent is, don't we? We understand what he was called. I mean, there were f- flying fiery serpents. There might still be somewhere that we don't know, but there are some. But we also know that Satan is a serpent. We also know that he is a dragon, and we also know that he flies, and we also know that he has fire. You understand? So... Uh, And then Deuteronomy, let's see, Isaiah 30, verse number 6. It's the same translation of the word. So in understanding seraphim, you have to understand they're equated with burning or fire. The word is the same. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse number 6. The burden of the beasts of the south and the land of trouble and anguish. From whence come the young and old lion, the viper and the fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. The lion, the viper, fiery flying serpent. Okay? Um, There's more. It's rendered uh, fiery in the passage before us, seraphims. So we understand that Isaiah is talking about fiery, that, that seraph, those fiery, those burning one. It says, with twain he covered his face. And uh, this angel, these, these seraphim, with twain he covered his face. This is designed, doubtless, to denote the reverence, awe, inspired by the immediate presence of God. I mean, they're standing in the presence of God. What do they do? They cover their face. God is holy. Think about that. To cover the face in this manner is the natural expression of reverence. And if the pure and holy seraphim evince such reverence in the presence of God, with what profound awe and veneration should we, polluted and sinful creatures, presume to draw near to him? Assuredly, their position should reprove our presumption when we rush thoughtlessly and irreverently into his presence and should teach us to bow with lowly veneration and deep humility. Think about that. That when we pray, we're praying to God. We're praying, our prayer goes up to the throne of God. David talked about that. David said in Psalm that God heard his prayer out of, out of his holy, in his holy hill. God heard it from his throne. God heard his prayer. It went up to his throne. Turn to Revelation chapter 4. There's some seri- similarities here between these these angels, these seraphim and and cherubims as well. I think it's interesting that we read here in verse number 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne to worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns upon the throne, before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So these beasts are around about the throne, right? They're around. The first beast was like a lion. The second beast like a calf. The third beast had the face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying a- eagle. And the four beasts had each one, each of them, six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. Now, I have somewhat of a theory. I, I've heard that these are cherubims, and, and I, I kind of tend to agree. I tend to believe that because they have six wings, they're not. I believe they're, I believe they're seraphims. I just don't believe they're cherubims because they have six wings. I also think that the reason why we don't, their faces aren't described in Isaiah is because of the New Testament revelation had not been given yet. Christ had not come yet. So I believe that, that, that 
everything was revealed. The, that veil was torn down, right, between the, between the holiest. The veil was torn down, and, and, and clarity was given. And that's why I believe that we see their faces. The first piece is like a line. It's very similar to those cherubim. So it's really hard to discuss. It's really hard to understand why do they have four wings there? Why did they have four wings? Why did the cherubim that Ezekiel saw have four wings? Why do these have six? I can't answer that. There's some things that you just can't answer. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure why that is the case. In, in, all, in all actuality, it really doesn't matter. Maybe there are different processions of of uh, different orders. Maybe the cherubim come sometimes. Maybe the maybe there are different orders of cherubim. Maybe there are different orders of seraphim. Maybe they don't all look uniformly alike. Maybe there are some that are different. God chose not to tell us that. He, showed, he chose not to explain that to us very deeply. So we just have to say, okay, well, we'll see it someday. Amen? That's what we have to do. That's how we have to look at that. That's the only way we can look at it. It's also important to note that these beasts in heaven can talk. These, these are beasts. Holy, holy, holy. These are beasts in heaven and they're talking. We saw God allow Balaam's ass to speak, right? There are beasts in heaven that speak. I think you're going to see beast creatures that come down here and I think they're going to speak. I think you're going to see, if we're alive at that time, I think you're going to see those beastly creatures, maybe not those, but Satan's, the ones that fell, I think you may see them, and you may hear them speak. I think there will be beasts that speak. I, I, I absolutely believe that, because there are beasts in heaven that speak. The Bible says that they are beasts, and the Bible says, so, I want to ask you a question. What do you think about something? It says the first beast was like a lion. So do you think that the lions and all those things were created after these were created after, modeled after what was in heaven. So then this is, these are like the fourth, it says here the first beast was like a lion. Like a lion. Now why did he say that to us? Because it's not a lion. But it, the only way to describe it to us to make it make sense is to say, well, it's like a lion. Where do we see that too? Anybody remember where that was? That's not the only time that says something similar to that. Who remembers those lion-like men of Moab? Those men that were that were lion-like and they were in the pit. And they had to fight them and they were like these hybrid men. They didn't say they were men. They said they were lion-like. And right. And they were some kind of creatures. And that when when they're and, and why are those men noted, or those beings, those beast-like men, they are noted with the giants of David's mighty men and the battles that he fought. And those beasts are noted at that time, right? He says, says and then they slew these lion-like men in the pit, right? And then he slew, Ishbinob slew this man, and, and he talks about all the giants that were slain and the different men. Because there are creatures that are modeled after these. Now there are Satan's counterfeit creatures, I don't know what they're going to be like exactly. Well, we have a few ideas. But we know that these beasts in heaven talk. And they are called beasts. It says, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. By the way, there are cultures that worship the lion. There are cultures that worship the calf. Which one did that? Yeah, but where where before that, where'd they learn it from? Egypt. They learned it from Egypt. The Apis bull. They worshiped the Apis bull. Where did they get it from? Not from gods, gods, but the ones that fell. Yeah, all of them. They worshiped all those. The fourth piece is like a flying eagle. Like a flying eagle. Right? There you go. So you have these different beasts, creatures, that are up there. They're speaking. They're talking. They're intelligent. They can communicate. They can worship. That's what they do. My theory, which doesn't matter really, <laughs> but it's my theory, 
the, is that in the millennium, I, I think all animals will talk. I th- whatever God produces there, whatever God has, I think all of them will. I think in heaven, all of those. I think that, that, that whatever is produced, whatever creatures are there, whatever God makes new, and all, I, I think all of them will talk. Why wouldn't they? Right. Right. Why wouldn't they? Would cry out, right. So, we, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if that, if that happens in the future. It makes sense. It makes perfect sense that it would. Everything will be different. Yep. Always. So we are prepared for it. But the Bible did it way before all of them with Balaam's ass. Yes, the serpent talked. And the hybrids that are going to come up from the earth. I mean, there's there's a lot of weird stuff that nobody wants to talk about. <laughs> I kind of like it, but but <laughs> but there's a lot of weird stuff that nobody wants to talk about, and that's like talking snakes and stuff. It's like so when people say to you, "That's never going to happen," well, it already did, and he said it was happening there. It's right there. Yeah. Like origin? That'd be gay. Um, Twain, two wings alone of the six were kept ready for instant flight in God's service. They veiled their faces. Um, I like what he says here. They veiled their faces as unworthy to look on the holy God or pry into his secret counsels, which they fulfilled. I like that. That's interesting. That was an interesting take on that. Uh, Exodus 3, 6. Let's go there. We'll look at a few of these verses here. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So those angels, they do the same. They, they covered their face, right? How about Job 4.18? Nobody's allowed to cry. I'm not finished yet. Job 4.18. These that fell, he says about them, behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. I was talking about that today on my broadcast. Did anybody get to listen to that today? Anybody at all? I hope you get a chance to listen to that one. Did you listen to it? It'll help you. It talks about, I was talking about, um, uh, depression, and I was talking about dealing with uh, dealing with how Satan's hand is in that to try to depress us and make our make depression worse, and and make those things work. And I took Job chapter four. And you ought to listen to that; it'll help you a lot. And also, you it'll help you to listen to how to deal with others that are going through that. Some things not to do to people when they're discouraged. Uh, so uh, listen to that when you get a chance, if you haven't. Uh, already. It'll help you. And, and and if it doesn't help you, it'll help somebody else, which will in turn help you. So um, anyway, so if you get a chance to listen to that, I think it'll be a blessing to you. Job 15. Boy, I'll tell you what, reading the book of Job, I'm going through it in my devotions again. Almost make you feel like you got it easy when you start reading Job. <laughs> but you see a lot of pictures in there of things that can encourage you in Job's life. A lot of things. Job chapter 15, verse number 15. Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. You understand that? Where did the first sin take place? Heaven. At the throne of God. The one guarding the throne was like, I think we can take it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying that's, that's what it was. Satan was one of those guardians of the throne of God. The Bible says so. He walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. What else did he do? He was, he was, he was the covering. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. 
and I have set thee so. He was on the holy mountain of God. What did he do? He looked at him and said, I, I think I can go for it. Yeah. But that's where the first sin took place. That's why God will melt it all with fervent heat. That's why he will burn it all down. Yeah. He will melt the elements, the elements, with fervent heat. What heat? Himself. You understand that? Our God is a consuming fire. It is his own glory that he will melt it down with. When Satan is destroyed and the Antichrist is destroyed, they are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Whew. Wow. Wow. Never thought about that. Mm -hmm. And that's what God's going to do. He's going to melt it all down with his presence. All of it. He's just going to unleash his glory. Hmm? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to burn it all down. That's what he's going to do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does, because these, these seraphims are made of fire. They, they are made. We talked about the angels being made of fire, and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to burn them up. I'm gonna, I'm. But that's how God does a lot of things. I mean, if you look in the scriptures, like what you do, like David, like everything that David did, came back to him fourfold. I mean, God used the same thing that he did, and the same thing happened to him. Only God's mercy was on him, so he didn't consume him. But he did the same thing. So what is he going to do with those ministers of flaming fire? He's going to throw them in the fire. I'm telling you, it, you go all through the scriptures, and you see when the enemies of God, what they do against him, it ends up happening to them. He does the same thing to them. I mean the same exact thing. That's what he ends up doing. That's how God works. Amen. All right. Job 15. Oh, okay. Two covered their feet around the whole of the lower parts of their person. Uh, okay. Good. Let me, let me see that. Okay. Trapp says this about, about the uh, seraphims. He says, those heavenly salamanders that are all on a light fire, all are, are all on a light fire with the love to God and zeal for his glory. Fiery serpents full of deadly poison are also called seraphims. The Greeks call them. That old serpent, the devil, can transform himself into an angel of light. Turn to Revelation 5, 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Amen. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the numbers of them were, was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's a lot. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor. Wait, did you hear what you just said? Every creature which is un in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying. 
all those creatures he heard them saying. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne. Man, that is going to be one loud chorus. Right? From the sea, everywhere. From the earth, from the sea, from the heaven, from under the earth. Not the flat earth. That's right. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. So that's going on right there around the throne. You see those beasts. You see their worship. You see their, their wings. You see their description. You see that they are fire. They are made of fire. They are a higher order than the others. They have wings, which they're the ones that are described with wings. And they have six wings. That they have. So anyway, um, it is interesting, isn't it, to say the least. Now, let's close with this. I, I think I'm going to wrap this up here right now. No pun, Luke. No pun intended. <laughs> so what do we learn from angels? Number one, in Revelation 5.11, we learn worship. We learn worship. That's what we learn. What, is, what does 11 say? And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne of the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. What do we learn? We learn to worship God. A great portion of our day, our different times in our hearts, while we're working, while we're doing things, ought to be worship to the Lord. Amen? It should be. We learn worship. We learn We learn hymns. We learn to sing unto God. We learn to praise him. Number two, we learn obedience and service. Turn to Psalm 103. Verse 20 to 21. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments. Hearkening of the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. What do we learn? Service. That we ought to serve the Lord. Our lives ought to be filled with services. The angels, they, they teach us that. They, they, that they serve the Lord. And that's what we ought to do. We ought to be about our Father's business. We ought to be about serving the Lord. When Jesus came here the first, the, the first time, what, where was he? Uh, wish you not that I must be about my Father's business. He was in the temple. It was his Father's temple. He was about his Father's business. What was the business? That book. That was the business. We ought to, our lives ought to be about our Father's business. That's the same. And the angels, they, they, would sh they would show us the same thing. Obedience and service. God says it in his word, then we just do it. Amen. God says it in his word. I didn't say in your feelings or anything else. I said in his word, then you do it. Yep. What's that? Go ahead. Amen. That's right. It's a good way to end it, isn't it? That everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. And that's, that's what God wants from us. That's what, that's what we ought to give him. That's what we learn from angels. That's everything. Always praising God. How about 1 Peter chapter 1? Let's go there. They have an interest in God's word. So should you. First Peter chapter one, verse number 21. Or is it second Peter? It might. Oh, it's verse 12. I'm sorry. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto them searching. Let's go back to verse number 11. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed. That not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you 
by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. They have, an, they have an interest in the Bible. You know what? God's children, we are the sons of God, the Bible says. They are called the sons of God, right? We are called, why? Because we're begotten of God, that's why. That's why they're called it, because they are begotten of God. That's why they're called the sons of God. The Bible says that we're going to be like the angels, but here we should have the same interest that they have as far as God's word. See, they wait for God to instruct them. They want to be instructed by God. They live to serve God. You and I ought to, ought to be, have an interest in God's word, to wait upon God's word, to learn from God's word, to grow from God's word. We ought to have that desire in us. The Bible says, though, to desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Right? There's a new desire that comes when you're a Christian, when you're born again. Man, you're... You want to read all the Bible you can. You want to you, you, you want to do all you can. And I'll tell you what, you'll never feel that way again on this earth. I'm just going to tell you that you, you, you probably won't. You probably won't. You'll be revived many times in your life. God will send revivings and refreshings in your spirit. And, and he will revive you all your life. But there's something different about when you just get saved. <laughs> there's something different about that. But. When God puts his spirit inside of you, you'll be attracted to his book. You will be. You will be. And you'll be rebellious sometimes. And you'll stay away from it when you don't want to <laughs> want it to indict you. Because <laughs> you already know it's indicting you. But you'll eventually open it up, come back around and say, Lord, you were right. But you'll desire the sincere milk of the word. You've got to. But as newborn babes, when you were newly saved, you did desire it right away. I mean, man, you could, you could gobble it up, you could read it, and then you get kind of lax on it. You get used to things. That fiery flame that was there in the beginning, it starts to temper a little bit. And now you're not going off just pure passion. <laughs> right? you be faithful you continue on you keep getting you keep going through the word of god god will light your fire for you <laughs> he will <laughs> amen he will it'll be better because and the reason the reason that it will be better is because it'll be with maturity and you'll see how much you have to have it <laughs> that's the difference how many people have have how many people could say here tonight honestly that if you had to say it you know i kind of got cold in my bible time and then god caused some trials to come into my life and i had to get right with god i had to get back into it i had to get my my passion returned and i started reading more of god's word i started Needing God's word more. Right? It happens, doesn't it? Say, why is that, though? Because if you're saved, I mean, you should always. Yeah, I know what you should always do. But you don't do it all the time. So, because the flesh gets in the way. And there's so much other things that you can do, right? I mean. Moms, there's a thousand excuses you can make for not reading your Bible. Not one of them are valid. Did you hear that? Maybe you didn't like that, so I'll say it again. There are a thousand excuses you can make, Mom, for not being in your Bible. But not one of them are valid. Not one. You can be, and you should be. And you should put God's word first, like these angels do. They have a desire to look into those things. And if you start, see, that's the thing about the Bible. If you start, you'll get addicted. You'll want to know more. You'll want to learn more. And I think one of the main problems, and I don't, I'm really not wanting to go off on this, but it's actually very helpful, so I will. 
one of the main problems is the place that you might be at in your life right now, you're maybe not looking in the right place of the Bible. There are times when I had to go back, that I've had over the last three years to have to go back to the Psalms and read through the Psalms again, take notes on everything and go through because I needed it. There are times that, that I've went back through Job. I'm going back through Job again <laughs> right now because I just needed it. There are times that you'll live in the Gospels and you'll go through there and you'll go through those times. But there are different times in your life where you need different things from God's word. And you'll start to learn that through trials. It's the only way you get to know that you need God. Otherwise, you become self-sufficient in your own eyes. Right? How about love for Jesus? Look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse number 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Boy, they wanted to know what was going on, didn't they? They wanted to be there. Mark chapter, oh, Matthew, sorry, Matthew chapter 4. These angels, they love Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 11. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Why? Because they loved him. To encourage him, that's right. That's what they do. How about Luke chapter 15? The excitement about sinners being saved. Luke chapter 15, verse number 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. One sinner that repenteth. Joy in the presence of the angels. What are they doing? They're singing the hallelujah chorus up there is what they're singing. Amen. When one gets saved. And we ought to have the same joy. We ought to have that same joy for people to be saved. We ought to have that same desire for them to be saved. Well, that's a little bit about angels. Hopefully that gives you some understanding there. Those are the seraphim, the cherubim. We talked about them. The angels, there were two more really weird creatures that I haven't talked about yet, but I might not. But uh, they're really weird, and I'm trying to figure I, I have to go back and figure it out. But anyway, um, they're, they're not really angels. I think they're devils. They're, they are devils. So anyway, but uh, I didn't talk about them in my evil angels one I did on my broadcast either. But uh, they are interesting creatures, to say the least. So kind of weird, but. Maybe we'll talk about them sometime. Maybe not, though. We'll get you too spooky here. But anyway, a lot to learn about them. But your Bible is full of different examples of what the angels do, what their ministry is, and you won't know it all. <laughs> but you should try. You should try to learn it. So much in here to help you in your daily life to feed your soul with. Don't forget to do that. Don't forget to meet with God. Don't forget to be in your Bible. Don't forget to be praying to God. Don't forget to learn from the from the Word of God. Don't forget to memorize Scripture. Don't forget to meditate upon it. Amen? It's important. It's important. All right. Pray for us also this week. We've got some extra. We've still got the expenses that aren't taken care of yet that we need to get taken care of. So pray that the Lord would provide 
those things continue to provide as he does. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the word of God. And thank you for giving us the example of these angels that are up in heaven. And these seraphim and these cherubim that they serve you. And they love you and they wait on you and they minister on you to you. And Lord, help us. Help us to be willing, loving, kind servants that are excited about people being saved, lives changed, that we're excited about the word of God, that we have a desire to serve you with all of our hearts and serve our brethren and be clothed with humility. Please help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.